Star Wars The Phantom Menace was the most disappointing thing since my son. I mean, how much more could you possibly fuck up the entire backstory to Star Wars? And while my son eventually hanged himself in the bathroom of the gas station, the unfortunate reality of the Star Wars prequels is that they'll be around. Forever. They will never go away. There could never be undone. If you're someone who's under the age of like 20, who says his least favorite film in the series is The Empire Strikes Back because it was the most boringest one, then I suggest you shut this review off right now before I carefully explain how much of a fucking idiot you are. So where do I possibly start? Lisa, I hate you crunching. Nothing in The Phantom Menace makes any sense at all. It comes off like a script written by an 8 year old. It's like George Lucas finished the script in one draft, like he turned it in and they decided to go with it without anyone saying that it made no sense at all or was a stupid, incoherent mess. I guess at this point, who's gonna question George or tell him what to do? I take it, yeah. you say action after we roll camera? I'll say action. You don't. No, Some, like sometimes, sometimes I sometimes forget. People forget that. If I forget to say action or cut, just step in and say action and cut. He controls every aspect of the movie. He probably got rid of those people that questioned him creatively a long time ago. I also think that everyone just assumed that a Star Wars prequel would be an instant hit, regardless of what the plot was. Really, how hard could it be to screw up? It's like screwing up mashed potatoes. You boil the water and pour the, the packet. Number one, the characters. The biggest and most glaring problem with The Phantom Menace is the characters. This is like the most obvious part of movie making, but I guess I gotta explain it when talking about this turd. Let's start at movie making 101, shall we? You see, in most movies, the audience needs a character to connect with. Typically, this character is something called a protagonist. When you're in a weird movie with like aliens and monsters and weirdos, the audience really needs someone who's like a normal person like them to guide them through the story. Now this of course doesn't apply to every movie, but it works best in the sci-fi, superhero, action, and fantasy genres. I picked a few examples to illustrate this point. Marty McFly, John McClane, Billy Peltzer, Sarah Connor, Neo, Charlie Bucket, Peter Parker, Cliff Secord, Johnny Rico, Rocky Balboa, and Kevin Bacon. So in addition to being like an everyday kind of schlub, usually the pro protagonist is someone that's down on their luck, in a bad place in their lives, or someone where everything just doesn't always go perfectly for them. Either you choose to be at your desk on time from this day forth, or you choose to find yourself another job. Well, maybe it's time to get a real job. No McFly ever amounted to anything in the history of Hill Valley. Eventually, they'll be confronted with some kind of obstacle or struggle that they gotta deal with. War! We're going to war! If we like them, we hope they succeed. The drama in the film is the result of us rooting for them against opposition. Go get him, kid. Eventually, our men will find themselves in the lowest point where it seems like all is lost. But eventually, they'll pull through and conquer whatever force opposes them. You're a terminated fucker. It's satisfying when our hero gets ahead from where they started off at. I love you. I love you. They make like a change. This is called an arc. Often too, they'll get the girl in the end as icing on the cake. Now I need to explain that I don't think that all movies should be the same or conform to the same kind of structure, but it works well in certain kind of movies. 
So unless they're the Coen brothers, David Lynch, Paul Thomas Anderson, Stanley Kubrick, Alfred Hitchcock, Lars von Trier, David Cronenberg, Gus Van Sant, Quentin Tarantino, John Waters, Wes Anderson, Sam Peckinpah, Terry Gilliam, Martin Scorsese, Werner Herzog, or Jim Jarmusch, you really shouldn't stray away too far from this kind of formula. Especially if you're making a movie that's aimed at children that has a cartoon rabbit in it that steps in the poopy. Oh. This is all, of course, completely applicable to the original Star Wars film and the character of Luke Skywalker. I want to learn the ways of the Force and become a Jedi like my father. This was accomplished even without all the wonders of modern CGI. Now with all you've just learned in this video that I've made for educational purposes, I want you to tell me who the main character of The Phantom Menace was. I can tell you it's not the Jedi. They were just on some kind of boring mission that they didn't really care about. Plus, they are fucking boring themselves. What happens to one of you will affect the other. You must understand this. It wasn't Queen Amidala, because she was some foreign queen. The movie was certainly not really about specifically either. You might be thinking that it's Anakin, because he was like a slave and saved the day at the end by accidentally blowing up the starship. But the audience doesn't meet Anakin until 45 minutes into the movie. And then the things that are happening around him are pretty much out of his control or understanding. If a protagonist has no concept of what's going on or what's at stake, then there's no real tension or drama. Without that, there's no story. So the conclusion is that there isn't one. Before the movie opened, I was really excited to hear that Scottish actor Ewan McDonald was going to be playing Obi-Wan Kenobi. I thought that was a great choice, and he'd be perfect as the lead of this movie. But he wasn't really. He just sat on the ship and complained a lot. The Queen's wardrobe may be, but not enough for you to barter with. Not in the amounts you're talking about. So you may like the characters, you know, if you're stupid. But let's ask some real people about the Star Wars characters and see what they say. I pose this simple challenge to them. Describe the following Star Wars character without saying what they looked like, what kind of costume they wore, or what their profession or role in the movie was. Describe this character to your friends like they ain't never seen Star Wars. The more descriptive they could get, the stronger the character, eh? Han Solo. He's a uh, rogue. He's he's very arrogant, uh, but charming. Roguish, if you will. Han Solo is totally dashing. Wannabe dashing. He, he fancies himself a playboy. So, like, he's a, a, a smarmy, cocksure, uh, um... Luminizer? Scoundrel. Um, he is, uh, he is pig-headed. Completely sexy. A in like a bad boy sort of way, where like, he's gonna ride the line. He's got a bit of a, a, a dark streak to him with, uh, you know, shooting Greedo in the bar. But also, uh, deep down, uh, has a heart of, the thief with the heart of gold. That's his character, really. Qui-Gon Jinn. He is... Stoic? I don't remember that character. Okay, is Liam Neeson with the beard? Oh, yes. Well, he has a beard. Qui-Gon Jinn, and he, uh, he was... <laughs> <laughs> um... Let's see here, um... Stern? C-3PO. His character is the, uh, is kind of the bumbling sidekick. Afraid, scurdy cap, he's timid. C-3PO is anal retentive. Is prissy. Um, well, C-3PO is, is prissy. He's, uh, uh, used a lot as comic relief. He, he's the comic relief. High strong. He's bumbling, uh, effeminate. Queen Amidalan. That is going to be fucking impossible because she doesn't have a character. She is, um... <laughs> She's Natalie Portman. Uh, yeah, like, I, like, just kind of... Um, well, I can't say she's a queen. I was gonna say she's a queen. Normal, I guess. Just kind of normal. Makeup would be a description. I was gonna describe the makeup. Her <laughs> describe... Queen Amidala's character, um, monotone. She's the... She looks a lot like Kira Knightley. 
<laughs> I can't answer that. You know it. So. Uh, she is. This is funny, by the way. I get it. Number two, the story. The second biggest problem with the Phantom Menace is the whole story and the way it was told. It's almost mind-boggling how complex the awfulness is. From the very start of this movie, I could tell something was really wrong, just by the way it started. It opens with some boring pilot asking for permission to land on a ship that looks like a half-eaten donut with a donut hole in the middle. What the fuck is that? Then two cloaked figures walk into a room in a completely flat angle. They sit down in a conference room, drink tea, and wait to talk about a trade dispute with something that looks like my ex-wife. While they eventually do get to the ball-numbing, mindless action that the fanboys crave, I found myself utterly bored already. Compare this fecal matter to the opening of the original Star Wars. You see, a guy named William Shakespeare once said, Brevity is the soul of wit. This just means don't waste my time. You keep it nice and simple. I said stop wasting my time. Stop it! Without saying one word of awkward, boring, political dialogue that goes on for ten minutes, we know everything we need to know just by the visuals. Rebels. Empire. We get a sense of how small and ill-equipped the Rebels are, and how large and powerful the Empire is. The low angle implies dominance, and the length of the Star Destroyer implies the long reach of the Empire. This shot says everything we need to know without saying one word. In fact, this is so genius, I have a feeling that George Lucas had nothing to do with it, and probably fought against putting it in the movie. So this comparison of openings is a small example of the overall styles of both films. The original trilogy was a modern-day homage to the classic adventure serials of the past, the kind I used to watch when I was in my 40s, good versus evil, the classic hero on a journey, the adventurous rogue, a damsel in distress, the wise old sage, gay robots, and an epic quest of discovery. The new movies are about shoving as much crap into each shot as possible. It's so dense, every single image has so many things going on. This is part of the reason why I find the special edition so fucking offensive. Because you're into what's happening in the movie, and they keep shoving more shit on the screen to distract you. It reminds me of a child waving his arms in the background for attention. Doesn't Lucas realize that cluttering the frame up with shit is not what makes Star Wars good? It's so dense, every single image has so many things going on. Fuck you, Rick Berman. You ruined this too? Stop ruining w Wait a minute. That ain't Rick Berman. What is it with Ricks? So the film is called The Phantom Menace, and by the nature of the story, there is no clear villain. Hey, idiot! You're not making the usual suspects here. You're making a movie for children, right? Supreme Chancellor, delegates of the Senate. A tragedy has occurred, which started right here with the taxation of trade routes, and has now engulfed our entire planet in the oppression of the- How about a bad guy in the movie whose motivation is clear? Commander, tear this ship apart until you found those plans, and bring me the passengers. I want them alive! The prequels should be very similar in style to the originals, because I don't like things that are different. Number 3. Death and Space Taxes So when you find yourself thinking things like, huh? Or what? When you're watching how illogical characters act in a movie, it's not really a good sign. Anyways, so at the end of the movie, Yoda makes Obi-Wan a Jedi Knight. Confer on you the level of Jedi Knight, the Council does. Even though in the opening titles it says he's a Jedi Knight. So we'll just call him Jedi Knights too. So the Jedis are there to do what exactly? According to the opening title crawl, it was to settle a dispute over the taxation of trade routes. Oh. So what makes the Jedi Knights experts in intergalactic trade laws? So the Trade Federation have set up a blockade around Naboo in order to stop them from getting space supplies which instantly causes some kind of crisis that we never see. Okay. I don't get it. Why would an organization called the Trade Federation want to blockade trade? There's the blockade! 
Usually a blockade is to stop something you don't want to get in. You see, we once set up a naval blockade around Cuba to stop the Russians from setting up missile launchers there. It was a little event you might have heard of. It wasn't a big deal, you know. But you might have heard of it. It was called World War One. Jeez, you stupid people gotta learn your history right. So if the Trade Federation were like merchants moving goods and services around the galaxy, then why did they seem more like a military with armies or robots? However, if they were like a bureaucracy that was in charge of overseeing and regulating trade routes, you'd think they'd be happy about the whole new space taxes. Unless all the taxes went straight to, like, Space Obama and they didn't see any of it. The point is, I'm still not sure what the donut chips were there to do. And don't any of you f***ers tell me that it was explained more in the novelization or some Star Wars book. What matters is the movie. I ain't never read one of them Star Wars books, or any books in general for that matter. I ain't about to start. Don't talk about them stupid video games or, or novels comic books or any of that fucking crap. I seen enough of that shit. I got Phantom Menace toys scattered all over in my basement. Anyway, so I realized that Senator Palpatine was using the Trade Federation to create a crisis to advance himself politically. Like that was the plot, I think. But the conflict from the blockade and the subsequent invasion is the entire movie. Understanding what role the Trade Federation played in this is important. Well, you know, what the blockade was about, who was getting taxed, what kind of supplies were so crucial to the Nabu. What was it, like medical supplies? Was there some kind of plague? Did they not have the capacity to survive on such a lush planet with a huge power reactor for one day without space trade? You see, I would have accepted the idea of some kind of mystery villain if the basics were at least clear. So when two guys wearing robes come on board their ship, Rosie the robot just assumes they are Jedi Knights and tells the Shatnarians. The ambassadors are Jedi Knights, I believe. Even though almost every single character wears robes in Star Wars. Then somehow this robot knows or thinks they're Jedi Knights. Hey idiots, so much for the disguise. Even a protocol droid could sniff you out. Maybe it's not a disguise, but whatever. So the Shatnarians immediately inform this mystery guy who they're running this scam with, a guy who looks like Satan, that Jedis are on the ship. And of course, so we can have an action scene, he tells them to kill the Jedi. Kill them immediately. You see, they never once went into the room to say hello to the Jedi, and that they'll be right with them. But they tell Palpatine that they are Jedis. And then they try to gas them to death, based solely on the hunch of a droid. Who's fucking with my medicine? Who wants a pizza roll? Email me if you want a Anybody pizza roll. Want a pizza Post roll? a comment on this web zone if you want a pizza roll. Now this is where it gets complex, my lovelies. So I think this is what happened, I'm not sure. But Palpatine wanted to create a crisis on Naboo so that the naive young queen would propose a vote of no confidence for Chancellor Valorum. This would lead to Palpatine getting elected in his place, right? Like, I mean, that's the plot? I think? So how does killing the Jedi or creating a communications blackout on the planet even get word back to the Senate that there is a crisis? At the end of the movie, Amidala goes back to the planet to solve the problem herself. Because the Senate wanted to send an independent team to investigate whether or not the invasion was real. Will you defer your motion to allow a commission to explore the validity of your accusations? I guess the testimony of two Jedi Knights wasn't good enough. Those were the guys that Valorum trusted enough to settle the whole dispute in the first place? That don't make sense. So anyways, when, when the guys told Palpatine that, that Jedis were there, he should have said this. Tell the Jedi that there will be no negotiations. Tell them that you plan to invade the planet next, and then send them back to Coruscant to inform the Senate. Instead, he tells them to do the exact opposite of what will help his plan. Like he wanted her to sign the treaty, right? I want that treaty signed. He seemed really intent on having her sign the treaty to make the invasion legal. So what if she was like a total coward and then actually signed the treaty? Like right away? Then the crisis would be over and there'd be no need for a vote of no confidence. See what I mean? This sounding like an eight-year-old wrote it? So anyways, it's time to kill off the Jedi. Oh good. How do they go about it? Well, they start pumping in an obvious deadly white gas into the room. 
This alerts them to danger. Well, actually, blowing up their ship does. I guess they should have pumped in the gas first, and after the Jedis were dead, then blow the ship up? Anyways, back to the gas. Hey, idiots! Have you ever heard of carbon monoxide? It's odorless and colorless. Also, moments earlier, the Jedi willingly drank tea that was given to them while they discussed how everything felt really fishy. I sense an unusual amount of fear for something as trivial as this trade dispute. Hey, you guys got any rat poison lying around? Put it in the tea! Put it in the tea! They'll drink it! Put the rat poison in the tea! So anyways, then the dioxin starts filling up the room, and then... Dioxin. Hey, wait. How does Qui-Gon know what kind of gas it is before he smells it? Isn't that like a contradiction? Do you smell the deadly white gas? I guess it's a little too late. Maybe we just got a little sniff of it. Anyways, you know, this idea could work because we see that the Jedi hold their breath, which implies there's some kind of danger of them running out of breath, right? Maybe they could hold their breath for like two hours because they're Jedis. Well, no, that's not true because later in the film we see they need to use them breathing things underwater for that short swim to the Gunga Sea world. So anyways, it's like the Jedi know that the droids are going to open up the door in a very short time before they run out of breath. Because they don't immediately start trying to cut their way out. Which is what I'd be doing. I'd probably be screaming too, like a little girl. So what are they doing in there? Then the dumbest line in the movie is said. They must be dead by now. Destroy what's left of them. What does that mean? Hey asshole! How about you leave the door closed for like four hours? And then if they try to cut through the door, start shooting them in the face. Then pump in more gas and keep pumping it in. So they open the doors anyways, and they let the Jedi out and attack them with completely useless robots. Just tell them to leave, and then you don't want to negotiate. And then when their ship flies out of your space dock, shoot it with lasers! Also, we need to consider the fact that killing two Jedi that were sent there as peaceful ambassadors would be a pretty heinous crime in the eyes of the Galactic Senate, an organization that runs everything, including the space taxes. I mean, you could just claim that they never got there. I know nothing of any ambassadors. I have assurances from the Chancellor. His ambassadors did it right. But now you've got the burned wreckage of their ship inside your horribly burned docking bay. Number four, who's doing what? Where? Why? Why are the Shatnarians taking orders from this mystery hologram again? What did he promise them that would be so worth risking their entire organization for? The location of the Fountain of Youth? A planet made of gold? Corrective surgery for this woman's face? Seriously, what was it? Oh, we're never told, are we? Generally speaking, it's easy to get a handful of insane people to follow you on some kind of legal or crazy scheme. But when you're talking about a huge organization that's run with military efficiency, then they're probably going to want something in return for the use of 30 of their ships and risking everything. Darth Sidious can't really promise them future political favors because it would give away who he is. When they got arrested at the end, they could just say, It was like a hologram in a cloak. He made us do it. In fact, he looks like... Palpatine. And he sounds like him, too. We got the recordings of the hologram. You want to look at him? I find it hard to believe that these guys never started pointing fingers after they got caught. Number five. I can't put enough quotation marks around the word story, so I won't try. Sir, they've gone up the ventilation shaft. How do you know that? I said, how do you know that? Answer me, thing in the mouth face. What is that, anyways? What, did you smoke too much? What's wrong with your face? Anyways, Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon, they end up in the hangar bay somehow, where the droid armies are being staged for an invasion. Why don't the Jedis just start fighting all of them? Then steal a ship and head back to Coruscant to tell the Galactic Senate what's going on. It's not so crazy, because later in the film, they attempt to run the blockade with one ship and they make it through. The fact that they even tried that makes this a possible option. What is wrong with your face? But instead, Qui-Gon in all his wisdom thinks it's a better idea to go down with the army to, quote, warn the Naboo. We've got to warn the Naboo and contact Chancellor Valorum. Hey, genius. If you're going down with the army, don't you think it's a little too late to warn them about the army? And what the fuck are the Naboo gonna do anyways? They don't even have a real army, just volunteers. 
Our security volunteers will be no match against the battle-hardened Federation Army. So the droid army just rolls in, unchallenged as expected. Just like the Nazis into France in a little historical event you might have heard of. Mm, what was it called? Uh, the, the French Revolution? Anyways, so then for no reason they decide to stow away on different ships. Let's split up. Stow aboard separate ships and meet down on the planet. Is this guy a fucking retard? Maybe that's why they call him Qui-Gon Jinn. Because he's always drinking gin. This is a minor point, but what would going down on the planet on separate ships accomplish? Let's think about this. Number one, increase the chances of getting caught by 100%. Two, have no one else to help you if you get caught and get into a fight with robots. Three, increase the possibility of getting separated by hundreds, if not thousands of miles by not knowing where the other craft is going to land on the planet. But thankfully they both aren't discovered and they meet up in the same spot in the woods. Then, although the reason for them going down to the planet was to warn the Nebu about the army, they decide to follow a cartoon rabbit underwater. Why? Why not just keep moving towards the Nabu city? Hey, Ginny, I thought you went down there to warn the Nabu. How is this gonna accomplish that? What was your plan from the beginning when you got down there? Did you plan to find a magical underwater craft that would go through the planet's core? Or did you just plan to run along the surface? What's wrong with your face? This is the first point they should have ditched Jar Jar. This is also the point when the movie starts to officially fall apart. This is the moment when the Star Wars saga is now damaged totally beyond repair. The lapses in common sense and logic begin to compound on the movie and now it is broken. I could end this review here, but I'm really just getting started. What is wrong with your face? Continued in part two. Number six, invasion of boring. A communications disruption can mean only one thing, invasion. It can also mean that you didn't pay your phone bill. So the Nabu seemed to be on the case about this thing. The old guy seems to know what's going on. And although they are a peaceful people with no army, this asshole seems to be an expert in the process of planetary invasions. So what exactly is the purpose of this invasion? It's almost like after Lucas wrote the invasion scenes, he didn't really know what to do next. So he thought he'd make the Queen have to sign a treaty to make the invasion legal. I mean, why not? First of all, forcing someone to sign a treaty sort of contradicts the purpose of a signature on a treaty. You might as well just forge it if you're gonna make her sign it. So meanwhile, Qui-Gon Boos and Obi-Wan are in the underwater city. Qui-Gon is still talking about warning the Naboo that they're about to be attacked when he really doesn't know that they're actually going to attack them. A droid army is about to attack the Naboo. Then since Qui-Gon is jumping to conclusions and making shit up, Obi-Wan starts doing it too. Once those droids take control of the surface, they will take control of you. First of all, the only thing that the Jedi's know at this point is that they were sent to settle a trivial dispute about taxing trade routes. All of a sudden, Obi-Wan thinks he knows the entire plan of the Trade Federation. How does he know they plan to take control of the surface and the underwater city too? Maybe they just want to steal some kind of priceless artifact from the Nabu. Maybe the Nabu did some kind of horrific act against the Trade Federation and they're just getting some revenge. You and the Nabu form a symbiont circle. What happens to one of you will affect the other. You must understand this. Now what does that even mean? How is a totally isolated city underwater affected at all by the Nabu being attacked by droids on the complete other side of the planet? Yes, I said the other side of the planet because... The speediest way to the Nabu is going through the planet core. By planet core, I assume he means planet core. Like the center? Usually that's what a core is. So they spend two hours flying deeper and deeper into the planet underwater. I guess to emerge on the other side of the planet? I guess? This begs the question, why did the droid armies land on the other side of the planet where the Gunga City is? If they expected no opposition, why land in the middle of forests and spend time chopping through the woods so far away from your target? Why not just land right outside the city? Or in the city? Anyways, so like idiots, they surface the bongo right in the middle of an occupied city in broad daylight. 
And then Ginny just looks around without any attempt at subterfuge. Inside the city, Queen of Manalan has been captured by the Green Guys. But instead of forcing her to sign the treaty right then and there, or keeping her locked up inside the big capitol building under heavy guard, they inexplicably send her away from them. Commander. Yes, sir. Process them. Remember, this is the most important person in their whole plan, and they send her to be processed in some place called Camp 4. Captain, take them to Camp 4. Roger, roger. Oh. But at least they remembered to send her with a whopping eight battle droids to protect her from the two Jedis that they just discussed they had not found yet. You didn't tell him about the missing Jedi. No need to report that to him until we have something to report. But don't worry. These battle droids have proven very effective against Jedi Knights. Oh. Wait. No. You know, it really adds a lot of tension in the movie when the main enemy forces are totally ineffective. There are too many of them. It won't be a problem. Oh, it shouldn't be a problem. Oh, now I'm really on the edge of my seat. Yeah, you know, Jedi cut them down like they're butter. And they really are pretty useless. Fuck you. Number seven. Escape! From the planet of boring. Okay, so they free the Nabu Air Force, and then they get on a silver jet thing to run through a blockade. Which again, I remind you, the point of a blockade is to stop ships from getting through. So Qui-Gon Jinn could have very easily gotten everyone killed. Does anyone smell gin? Hey, it's 11.30 in the morning. Who's been drinking? So no one's really that nervous about running this blockade until the shield generator gets hit. Shabams! Blammo! Shabams! Shield generator's been hit! Ooh, then suddenly it's dangerous. Hey, wait. Just like knowing what kind of deadly gas it is before you smell it, how does the shield generator get hit while the shields are up? Shouldn't it? Ah, oh, fuck it. If we can't get the shield generator fixed, we'll be sitting ducks. Wait, slow down, asshole. Everything anyone says in this movie makes no sense, so I have to keep up here, okay? Stop. The shields are gone. Okay, wait. We're losing droids fast. Stay here. Wait. And keep out of trouble. Hold on a minute. Hold on. If we can't on. get the shield generator fixed, we'll be sitting ducks. Okay, wait. How will you be sitting ducks without a shield generator? Are you implying that with the shield generator you wouldn't be sitting ducks? That you would be able to breeze through this blockade somehow? Doesn't that defeat the purpose of a blockade if any ship with an operational shield generator would suddenly not be a sitting duck and could go through the blockade? I would think that with Trade Federation ships of that size and quantity, you'd get blown to fucking pieces with or without shields if they all fired on you? So anyways, R2-D2 sticks a thing in a thing and fixes the shield generator. Then the dude says, Deflect the shields up at maximum. Okay, so then that suddenly relieves all the tension in the scene and allows them to escape the blockade. If you'll notice though, after the shields are back up at maximum, they don't get hit again. So really, R2 fixing the shield generator did nothing at all. M maybe it gave them the confidence to escape? So then after they show no emotion at all about the droids being picked off one by one, We're losing droids fast. They inexplicably send R2 up to the Queen to get a pat on the head, I guess. She thanks the little piece of equipment like it's a person. Hey, nobody thanked the ship. I think that did a lot more to help him escape. Thank you, R2-D2. You see, normal people don't think of droids as people. Even the kind-hearted Luke Skywalker reacts with sarcasm when introducing himself to R2-D2. And this is my counterpart, R2-D2. Hello. Would a queen really thank a droid? I don't know, maybe. Again, this is a film for babies. I must be frank, Your Majesty. There is little chance the Senate will act on the invasion. Chancellor Valorum seems to think there is hope. If I may say so, Your Majesty, the Chancellor had... Wait, I gotta get this straight here. Hold on. So, at this point, the queen in the middle that's wearing black is the decoy, but the real queen is Padme, is in the orange. Right? Okay. So the handmaiden decoy then orders the queen to go clean the droid? Clean this droid up as best you can. It deserves our gratitude. Did Amidala ask to be sent off on a menial task prior to this so she could have a scene where she meets Jar Jar Binks? You'd think the real queen would want to hang out in the throne room area to stay current on any updates about what's going on? And why did they even bring a dirty droid up to the queen? 
Did they really think that a member of royalty was going to care that a droid fixed something and then personally thank it? So maybe the Queen and the Handmaiden, it's like a little game that they play, you know? When I'm the Queen, I'm going to have you go clean toilets. <laughs> when I'm the Queen, I'm going to have you die for me in a horrible explosion. Oh, wait. That happened. I'm so sorry. Number eight, I'm going to slit my wrist. It's hard to stomach any more of this shit. I still don't know who the main character is and why we should care about any of this. At around this point in the original Star Wars movie, we've been with Luke almost the whole time getting to know him. We see his plight, his hopes and dreams, we feel his frustration, and then his sadness. The slow build-up added depth and emotion and anticipation for the story to expand. In The Phantom Menace, we have nothing. We have a monotone queen who's hiding from signing a treaty that's supposed to do something. Why in fuck's name should we care at all? I don't care about any of these characters. And to top that, we constantly have to question every single action that's taken by Qui-Gon, the wise Jedi. Almost every single line of dialogue makes no sense. You don't want to attract attention. If you're trying to avoid drawing attention to yourself, then why are you taking Jar Jar Binks into the city with you? Leave him on the ship! My droid has a readout of what I need. You say you took R2-D2 because he has the specs and the type of part you need, but yet Watto seems to know what you're talking about and you have a thingy that shows it. R2 is never used for that purpose and does nothing at all. The two most effective, clear-minded, logical guys stay on the ship and wait, while the clumsy idiot, the slow-moving droid, a vulnerable, attractive young woman, and a drunk go wandering around the dangerous city. These two guys probably would have had the part by now. That's great. It's gonna be great. That's gonna be great. It's gonna be great. That's gonna be great. Peruska? Cut. Let's try it again. Number nine. If I get a brain aneurysm as the result of this review, can I hold the filmmaker's response? At this point, I realize who the Phantom Menace is. No, it's not Jorge. It's Qui-Gon Jinn. His character is totally baffling to me, and I do not know why he's in this movie. If you ask me, Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi should have been combined to form a new character, called Obi-Wan Kenobi. Obi-Wan should have been the younger, eager, adventurous Jedi who found Anakin, formed a bond with him, and then really wanted to train him in the Jedi arts when Yoda told him no. Instead, Obi-Wan, who seemed totally irritated with Anakin the whole movie, suddenly wants to train him at the end, only because Qui-Gon said to. I gave Qui-Gon my word. If they did have to have Qui-Gon, they should have had him on the ship, just like meditating the whole movie, and saying very little, and, and just being wise. But then when Qui-Gon dies, Obi-Wan is left to move on without an older, wiser voice of reason, thus setting the stage for a poorly trained Anakin. Again, it's like poetry, so if they rhyme. <laughs> yeah, George, that's true. But the only thing poetic here is that I was vomiting in stanzas. I don't even know what that means. So for no reason, Obi-Wan is the one who does not want to defy the Council. He's not a risk taker and he complains all the time. We could be stuck here a very long time. Then the older, wiser Jedi is the opposite of what he should be. Let's break down Qui-Gon, all the way to his midichlorians. Number one, he has very questionable moral values. Qui-Gon Jinn repeatedly uses his Jedi mind trick to his advantage. Whether it's to get Boss Nass to give him a bongo, Risa give Yusa on the bongo. Which they completely trash. To use worthless money to scam Watto out of his ship parts. Credits will do fine. Or to fix a legitimate bet to his advantage. It's generally wrong to do these things, wouldn't you say? You can argue that the ends justify the means. But if that's the case, then why didn't Qui-Gon just steal the part from Watto? He could sneak in in the middle of the night and just take the part. Or... Take it by force. And I don't mean that kind of force. I mean choke Watto while Padme grabs the part and they run out of the shop. Basically, it's the same as trying to trick him into accepting a worthless currency for the part. In the end, Watto's just out of the part. This also leads me to believe that Qui-Gon Jinn is incredibly stupid. He could have just went to another junk dealer and used his Jedi mind trick to swap out the Republic credits for money that Watto would take. In fact, when they arrive in town, he says, We'll try one of the smaller dealers. Smaller dealers. Well, that implies there's larger ones. 
Watto tells him he's the only guy in town who's got the part. And no one else has a T-14 hyperdrive, I promise you that! <laughs> well, either Watto is using an older-than-dirt sales tactic, or Qui-Gon can really pick out which shop to go to randomly. Oh, wait. I guess Metachlorians told him where to go so they could find the boy. Oh, uh, it was Destiny or something. Hey, here's another idea! Why don't you trade the Naboo cruiser for a less fancy but functional ship? Or maybe hire a transport? Pay them all the money you have now and then promise more when you get to Coruscant. Sound familiar? Someone who's like a, a, a transport ship captain or a smuggler would have use for Republic credits because they travel around the galaxy. Probably go to other spaceports. You know, makes sense. But instead of using like the most common sense approach to everything, Qui-Gon concocts some kind of convoluted scheme so that we could get to the pod race. I honestly still don't understand it. <laughs> my ship will be the entry fee. What would the boy ride? He smashed up my pod in the last race. Well, I have acquired a pod in the game of chance. So, you supply the pod and the fee. If it's going to be 50-50, I suggest you front the cash for the entry. I supply the boy. We split the winnings 50-50, um, I think, huh? You keep all the winnings minus the cost of the parts I need. So, you supply the pod. We lose. You keep my ship. Who was betting what? Then it gets more complicated later, when the bet changes. I'll take that bet. I'll wager my new racing pod against, say... Well... The boy and his mother. No pod is worth two slaves. The boy then. So, Anakin built the pod, but Watto didn't know that he built the pod, so that there he raced with Watto's pod. So then Anakin tells Qui- If Watto wins, Anakin tells Qui-Gon to pretend that it's his pod. And Watto says, I'm gonna put up the entry fee if you uh, let me use your pod. If they win, then the boy gets- they get the money for the part. But if they lose, then Watto keeps the pod and the boy. Qui-Gon would have to pay back the Republic credits. Oh wait, no, he bet, he bet the ship. He bet the ship, and then if he loses the pod, race, then Watto gets the well, ship in exchange for the putting up the credits. entry. Oh, wait, no, if Qui-Gon wins, the then he gets the, the prize money. But then, then later on, they throw the, the boy actually the into the deal. First it's the ship versus the pod, the and um, the mom and the bat. But so then, if uh, Watto wins, I don't know. If, if Qui-Gon... I lost everything. Whenever you gamble, my friend, eventually you lose. Number 10, Anakin Skywalker. No one likes little kids, especially ones that can't act. Peruskin? Cut, let's try it again. I'm a person and my name is Anakin. It's a kiss of death for your movie. I've been wondering, what are midi chlorians? The way they have it is that Anakin and his mom live in a comfy little hut, and if they leave, there's a bomb in their brain. Any attempt to escape, and they blow you up. Boom! I think that's the worst plot device ever shoved into a movie for convenience. What purpose did Shmi Skywalker serve to Watto? But she, she cleaned her own dishes. Oh, and then let's move on to this. What about the idea that Anakin is the one who built C-3PO? Wait. Oh. This is wrong for so many reasons. I'm gonna list three of them. So the idea is that Anakin built C-3PO to help his mom around the house. He's a protocol droid to help mom. But a protocol droid is typically used for etiquette and protocol. You, I suppose you're programmed for etiquette and protocol. They're basically like robot diplomats, not really very handy technically. Hello, I am C-3PO human cyborg relations. It says his human cyborg relations. He doesn't say cleans dishes. C-3PO is clumsy, awkward, and useless. Unless you need someone to translate a language. I'm not much more than an interpreter. Plus, his arms don't even bend. What the fuck is he supposed to help the mom with? A vacuum would have been a better thing to build. Or maybe a vibrator. Also, if you're a little boy with the knack for building things with spare parts, then why would you build the exact same droid that seems to have been mass-produced by a manufacturing plant somewhere? Wouldn't you build some kind of unique robot from your own imagination? And to add to that, Watto already owned a protocol droid. It's laying there in the garbage dump. Why not just fix that one? Oh, we're still on this planet, are we? So Qui-Gon manages to pull off the most convoluted bet ever and somehow wins everything except for Anakin's mother. Even at the end of the movie when they saved the day and probably could get the cash to buy the mom from Watto, 
They don't go back for 10 years. Number 10. On to planet number 3. Is it time for death yet? Welcome to Coruscant, home of the mid-air collision and boring scenes. So the queen waits around for some kind of approval or for something to stop her people from dying. Why are they dying? I guess they're dying though. But I didn't see anyone die. In fact, I haven't even seen any Naboo citizen at all. As far as I know, it's a city with 20 or so pilots, a couple of bureaucrats and officials. Then the queen gets impatient. She asks for a vote of no confidence and then decides to go back to Naboo to fight a huge invasion force alone. Then the Jedi Council tells Qui-Gon that he cannot start training Anakin, but he does it anyways. I'm not allowed to train you. So I want you to watch me and be mindful. Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon both talk about how Anakin is dangerous when he's standing right there. The boy is dangerous. They all sense it. Why can't you? Oh god, I hope we didn't hear that. Did he, did he hear that? So then George Lucas completely and utterly finally ruins Star Wars forever by having Qui-Gon explain that the Force is microscopic organisms. The Delorians are a microscopic life form that resides within all living cells or that microscopic organisms in our cells tell us about the Force, or something. This entire idea and why this is in the movie is so baffling to me that I cannot even wrap my mind around it. It was never even explored or mentioned in the following two films. I can really only sum it up with one visual image. Finally, we come to the stupid ending, where again, nothing makes sense. After hours of boring, passionless, inhuman, robot-like, sleep-inducing dialogue, Jar Jar Binks screams in excitement that he's going home. He's going home! Come on, R2! This was actually the most shocking part of the whole movie, because at this point you forgot you were a human being. Oh, that's right, I'm still alive, and I'm watching a movie, I guess. Wait, did something happen? Number 11, please God, make it stop, make it end. Shazam! The silver spaceship flies back to Naboo. Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan go back as well for no reason, and they bring the little kid to a war zone for no reason. But really what's curious about this is that no other Jedi come back with them, even though there might be a Sith there. We will use all our resources to unravel this mystery. We will discover the identity of your attacker. Go with the Queen to Naboo and discover the identity of this dark warrior. Oh, I thought you were going to work on that. There's much more important work for the other 500 Jedis here. Eh, all the Jedis will just sit here and see who gets elected Chancellor, I guess. So then they start to approach the planet. Oh wait, something's missing. Hey Bob, hit the music! Yes, you want. What? No, not that one. The other one. The other song. Yeah, that's it. So everyone waits until they arrive at Naboo to start discussing how they have no plans at all and no idea what they're doing. I'm not sure what you wish to accomplish by this. We have no army. I can't fight a war for you. All of a sudden the whole blockade is gone too and there's just one ship. Where'd they go? That's convenient. The Gungans will not be easily swayed. And we cannot use our power to help her. Gee, you didn't have any problem doing it before, asshole. So then they make a plan. The Gungans act as robot bait so that the Queen can sneak into the palace and capture the Viceroy while the fighters attack the droid control ship. So what happens again when they capture the Viceroy? Without the Viceroy, they will be lost and confused. Um, excuse me? Hi. How do you know for sure that the robots will be lost and confused without the Viceroy? I mean, just by physically capturing him doesn't mean that all the robots will know that he was captured, right? I mean, it, it just kind of seems like you're making up a bunch of BS right now. Hey, maybe they're programmed to just keep doing what they're doing regardless until they receive more orders? Hey, maybe everyone should focus their efforts on taking out the droid control ship first? Then you could skip the other two dangerous parts. And you could just, like, walk up to the Viceroy and capture him. Who's in charge here? Uh, what's this all about again? Why are we all listening to this 14-year-old girl with no military experience? A and I thought serving under Picard was dangerous. Get back in the Star Trek reviews. There is a possibility with this diversion, many Gungans will be killed. Hey, wait, Gungans? I thought they were called Gungas. They all join forces and everything, and the Gungas battle the droids. And the Gungans were Gungas. The Gungans were Gungas. Um... What's happening in this movie? We are sending all troops to meet this army assembling in the swamp. Why would you meet them? Why not just ignore them? You have a fortified position. Can't you see an obvious ploy to draw away your protection? 
This will work to our advantage. How exactly will it work to your advantage? The Galactic Senate doesn't even know what's happening here. What does it matter? Once we get inside, you find a safe place to hide and stay there. Oh Christ, you brought the kid here too? Hey, here's a safe place to hide. Not in the city. I thought the battle was going to take place far from here. Hey, idiots. It was a diversion. I tried to warn you. So then the stupid kid sits in a cockpit of a ship. Gee, what a great place to hide. I wonder what's going to happen next. The difficulty is getting into the throne room. Once we're inside, we shouldn't have a problem. If the Viceroy was smart, he'd be in a location you would not expect to find him. But since he's clearly a complete idiot, then yeah. Yeah, he's probably in the throne room. Let's go with that. Oh, he's accidentally flying the spaceship. How cute. I hope he fucking dies. Wait, why is there a child-sized helmet and goggles in the cockpit? Nothing can get through our shield. Nothing except for the kid in the spaceship can get through your shields. Then our bad guy shows up, and he wants to fight the Jedi's, cause he wears black robes. I'm gonna get you, you guys are going down, and the Jedi say no, you're going down, idiot. Oh, and then they go from the palace to this room. What is this room? Is this in the palace? I mean, I know George wanted the Jedi's to fight in a cool place that's really Star Wars-y. So, so what, this is like a power generator? What is it power, the universe? So you're expecting me to believe that the people that built this technological wonder were dying without space supplies for two days? So I have another question. If the Sith have been extinct for a millennium, and only Jedi's use lightsabers... I saw your laser sword. Only Jedi's carry that kind of weapon. Then why are the Jedi's so darn experienced at sword fighting? So at the start of the film, we see that Jedi's can run at a super fast speed when the screenwriter doesn't know how to get them out of a situation where a powerful droid is shooting lasers at them. But we never see the Jedi's run fast again. Maybe there never really was a need to run fast again. Oh, yeah, that would have been a good time. Wipe them out. All of them. If the orders were to wipe them out, all of them, then why are they taking prisoners? I will not condone a course of action that will lead us to war. Roger, roger. Yeah, you're such a peaceful people that you keep guns in the armrests of your throne. Yeah, peaceful and paranoid? Now this is pod racing. No, no, this isn't pod racing. That was on Tatooine. You're in a spaceship now. Oh, wait. Oh, oh. He was doing like a thing. Number 12. Obi-Wan gets mad, and then I do. So we're back to the three guys we know nothing about fighting each other in a scene we have no interest in. Their flawless choreography lacks all humanity and emotion. But then something happens. Qui-Gon dies, and Obi-Wan is pissed. Hey, hey, maybe this will finally get good. Maybe I'll get emotionally involved. You see, Obi-Wan is pumped. He really wants to kick this guy's ass. And then, BAM! Oh. That's right back to highly choreographed fighting. It's like all this was planned out ahead of time. Hey, remember when Luke Skywalker got really pissed and snapped when Vader was taunting him? Remember how worked up and emotional he got? He just started wailing on Vader. There was no grace or complex choreography. He was just pounding him into submission, filled with rage. When you're worked up with emotion, you begin to lose your composure and control. You expose your humanity a little. Obi-Wan should have done that just a bit. I guess that's the director's fault, huh? In Empire, there's also very little complex choreography. Luke is just barely keeping up in his fight with Vader. Vader's just basically toying around with him. He could totally kick his ass at any moment, but he holds back. You see, this was their first duel. There's a lot going on between the two characters, outside the fact that they were swinging swords at each other. There is even a lot more going on at the end of Jedi. Luke was realizing he was kind of becoming his father and, and taking his place. The Emperor was proving a point that hate and anger can be a powerful ally. You got things like temptation, anger, revelation, defiance, sacrifice, and redemption. What's happening at the end of Phantom Menace? Three guys we don't care about are fighting each other over something. 
I gotta really stress this point that lightsaber duels have less to do with the fight itself, but more so with the internalization of the characters. So if you've ever said that the duel at the end of A New Hope was the worst one because it had bad fight choreography, and it was like an old guy and, and a guy in a mask who couldn't see what he was doing, so they are just kind of like awkwardly hitting him with swords, well then I'm afraid you've missed the point entirely. It's really about moments like this. Not this. It's more about this. I am your father. And not this. And more about this. Fulfill your destiny. And not so much about this. Now you might be thinking that the duel between Anakin and Obi-Wan had some kind of depth to it because they were former friends. Now while it's true that this indeed had a little more going on than nothing and even more nothing, this duel didn't need to be 45 minutes long. The ultimate point of everything was that Obi-Wan defeats Anakin. Having them fight in the most ridiculous of places only to wind up on a tiny hill at the end was overindulgent. This fight could have lasted three minutes in one location and still have the same impact in the story. The whole thing ends up going on so long that it actually becomes boring, despite the amazing visual effects. The ultimate irony is that this fight between the same characters years later is much more interesting than this one. You see, we need a deeper meaning to things. Without it, none of it really matters, does it? Special effects are just a tool means of telling a story. People have a tendency to confuse them as an end in themselves. Uh, a special effect without a story is a pretty boring thing. You said it, brother. Wait, you said that? Number 13. The ending multiplication effect. Since the first Star Wars movie, the endings have been getting more and more complicated, culminating with episode one. After that, they toned it down because they think they realized how awful it was. But let me break it down here. A new hope. The story is flawlessly built up to the final conclusion. Stop the Death Star before it blows up the planet. The Empire Strikes Back. All story points converge at Cloud City. Luke has his first confrontation with Vader, and Leia and friends try to escape. Return of the Jedi. Luke confronts the Emperor. There's a battle on Endor to destroy the shield generator. And the Rebel fleet attacks the Death Star. Now you got three stories going on at once. Finally, we get to the Phantom Menace. Gungans fight the droid army. Queen Amidaman storms the palace to get the Viceroy. Anakin and Naboo pilots attack the droid control ship. And Jedi's lightsaber fight in the Theed power room. Signing up for. This was one of the major mistakes made in episode one. Ironically, the simplest endings, the first two movies, with the least locations and events are vastly more interesting because the plot is built up to them and we can focus on the one thing. After the rough cut screening of the movie for the first time, everyone in attendance looks just as baffled at the clusterfuck as we were. George admits to throwing too much out there. I may have gone too far in a few places. Um, yeah? The editor then attempts to explain pacing and why four scenes with totally different emotional tones don't work well together. In a space of about 90 seconds, you know, you go from lamenting the death of, you know, a hero to escape, to slightly comedic with Jar Jar, you know, to mm -hmm. Anakin returning with his... But he kind of realizes he's wasting his time, so he stops. Rick McCollum is frozen in utter shock at how horrible the movie was. Internally, he regrets not challenging Lucas on some of the things he was worried about. Lucas then realizes that he can't remove major segments of the movie and editing because they're intertwined. I mean, I've thought about this quite a bit, and the tricky part is you almost can't take any of those pieces out of there now. Because no, each one kind of yeah, take takes you to the next place, the next and thing. you can't, you can't no, jump. No, I don't love it. Hey, it's too late now. Later on, after everybody started drinking, Lucas attempts to explain his newly minted bowel movement as bold and extreme, stylistic. It's stylistically designed to be that way, and you can't undo that, but we can diminish the effects of it. No one looks like they know what's going on, and they all look like they're about to start pointing fingers. But that's just my interpretation of this footage. I wasn't there. So now we get to the ending. 
they burn Qui-Gon's body, they, they celebrate Yoda, Yoda's, there's like an Indian chick there, and um, there's another thing that looks like Yoda, but it kind of looks like a midget. And then later on, or, or earlier or something, Yoda and, and Obi-Wan are talking in the castle, and, and Yoda says, Grave danger, I fear, in his training. I gave Qui-Gon my word. Oh, you gave Qui-Gon your word. I suppose it's better to rely on that than rather the whole prediction of grave danger. So it seems like the Jedi Council reluctantly agrees to let Obi-Wan train the boy for no real reason. Hey, remember, this is not like some kind of boardroom of company executives making a decision about applesauce packaging. These are Jedi Masters whose entire existence is solely based on the Force, feelings, premonition, and prophecy. When they all feel weirded out and predict grave danger, You'd think they, of all people, would follow their own instincts. But instead, for no reason at all, they allow the training. Agree with you, the Council does. Your apprentice, Skywalker, will be. Hey, maybe you should have just said no. Yoda's supposed to be really wise, right? Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. Wait, what did he just say? Maybe he isn't that wise, cause that don't make a lick of sense. Fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, hate leads to suffering. Can't anger lead to fear, and fear lead to suffering, and then suffering lead to hate? You see, when you have three totally interchangeable emotional states, they can't really be arranged in a certain pattern of logic. Let me share some real wisdom with you. Chicken leads to egg, egg leads to omelette. Omelette leads to fecal urgency. Number 14, the aftermath. The Phantom Menace is now the greatest example of cinematic blue balls in the history of motion pictures. And I ain't talking about the kind the Gungas had. Gungas. Never again will anything be more wildly anticipated or a bigger disappointment. So who dropped the ball? Well, I guess you could say it was everyone involved in the production. Mainly the producers and those higher up on the food chain. Sure, it's easy to blame George for the script and doing everything wrong, but those people who didn't challenge Lucas on some of the questionable ideas, they also carry some blame. To quote Gary Kurtz, You can really see this in the behind the scenes videos. People look scared around George. They laugh at his bad jokes. You're listening to the music. <laughs> <laughs> when he comes into a room, there's like silence and fear and terror. Every so often, you'll catch some looks of confusion and mistrust. You gotta wonder what some of these people were thinking. Now again, I must stress, I wasn't there and I can't pretend to know all the goings on behind the scenes, but it all seems pretty obvious if you think about it. Lucas has always been a rogue filmmaker who hated the studio system. He always seemed to want total control on his projects, which I can understand. And while a director should have control on the project, filmmaking should also be a collaborative process. The second screenwriter can help focus the story and the dialogue. Actors are creative people too. They can provide valuable insight on the characters and a lot of really good ideas. I love you. I know. And a good executive producer can be the voice of reason when things start to get out of hand. I think all this can be summed up with the expression, art from adversity. The original Star Wars was plagued with problems. Nothing worked right, things were rushed I guess, but it ended up being a great movie. When you can make a movie entirely in a computer, and then shoot everything against a blue screen in some kind of sterile laboratory, well, some of the magic is lost. When Obi-Wan was walking around in Kamino, George showed him concept paintings of, okay, now you're walking down the hallway and you're looking and you're seeing the cloning facilities, but there was nothing for him to see. It ends up all looking so clean and sterile, and it, and it lacks humanity, it lacks grit. The Phantom Menace also makes you wonder. With total control on every aspect of the film, from the writing to directing to casting, etc., this was the result? Then when you hear tales about how Luke was supposed to be a 65 year old man with a robot head, Han Solo was supposed to be like a frog, and C-3PO was like a slimy used car salesman type, 
C-3PO might sound like a used car salesman. You have to just wonder, what if? What if Lucas had the kind of control back then he has today? Now I ain't gonna say much more here. I don't know all the facts. You know what to do.